All right. Well, we're close enough now. I think everybody knows what the count is, so I'm not going to say it. <coughs> six, seven, three. <coughs> Number six. I did say it. I lied. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so we will be having uh, two services next weekend. For all of you that may be joining us via the live stream, you probably already know that, but we will be here Saturday and Sunday at being Pentecost weekend. So hope you can join us. So, <clears throat> boys and girls, how are we doing? Look at your. Look at your, uh, yeah, blessed. And you're getting blessed more, looks like. Um, look at your instruments, your, your, your dashboard, your gauges, the lights, your, <coughs> well, I mean, you're, you're a pilot, right? We are. You're a pilot. Word speaks of, the word speaks of your course, right? And with a course, there must be a destination. Now you can you can run that course, you can boat that course, swim that course if you want to, or you can fly. But you are due to arrive, right? Due to arrive. Now going through the airports most recently, Charlotte and Tampa, and any airport you go into, there's always the, the flight schedule, right? And you can look and see if the flights are on time or whatever, and even apps on your phone. If you're picking up someone at the airport, you can find out. They're all there. It's all public knowledge. But in the airports, there are all these screens that let you know what's due to arrive, when it's due to arrive, if your flight's on time, and so forth and so on. Now, <clears throat> when you think about travel, or me thinking about travel, there's a line that comes in, and I use it from time to time. I think the last time that I kind of had a, a message with, with the line in it was at the feast at Walhalla uh, a couple years ago. Uh, homesick for a country, it's from, it's from the song Beulah Land. Now, they use it every now and then because <clears throat> the message is that powerful for me, to me. Kind of homesick for a country, a place you've never been. And it's, it's scriptural as well. And it's, um, yeah. So you're, and for that country, this country that we, if we aren't homesick for, maybe we ought to be, should be. The passport is having your name written, right? Because it says no one whose name is not in that book can enter this destination, can enter this place, this city, this wonderful place. So your passport is having your name written in that book. Now, as I was leaving, as I was leaving last Sabbath, there was a conversation at the table back here about the the the, the, the what is the meaning of the called versus the chosen? And I think it was, uh, I know it was Chris and I think Billy that were having that conversation. Billy kind of carrying it, asking, or his thoughts on what, what it meant be between being called and chosen, as, the, as Scripture points out to us that many are called and few are chosen. So that came to mind this morning as I'm studying, and it wasn't in these Scriptures, but I, I had tried to pull up something in the Bible app, and it gave me a list of verses, and two of those were, Revelation 13.8 and 17.8. And both of those talk about anyone whose name is not found written from the foundation of the earth will not be entering in, or they will be cast into the lake of fire, or whatever it is. So your name does have to be there. But at, when, at first glance, where my mind was, I thought, how could your name be there from the foundation of the world? I mean, I know that he says, I knew you before you were born, and you were the joy set before me, and that kind of stuff. So maybe it's possible. Maybe God, being the inhabitant of eternity, does know whose name's going to be there and whose isn't. I don't, I'm not going to get into that, but I think what it really means, more likely, is that since time began, your name has not, has not appeared in that book, so you got a problem. So, uh, name not written from the foundation of the world. And I want to I want to pick up a scripture here in Malachi too, not Malachi, Malachi also. Um, where am I going? Malachi 
Malachi 3. I want to pick up a couple of verses there. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 13 says, You have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? And this is, I'm reading from the NIV. You have said it is futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper, and even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. That's how he says you've, you've spoken evil against me or you spoke arrogantly against me. And it says in verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. Those who feared the Lord and honored his name. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as the Father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. Spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked between those who serve God and those who do not. So there is some warning there, isn't there? There's, there's great blessing in having your name written, but you want it in this book of remembrance or the, the Lamb's book, but, you know, this speaking arrogantly, what do, what, what do I get out of it? What do I get out of carrying out his requirements and going about like a mourner, you know? So anyway, and the ones that do evil get away with it. And it takes me, too, to a... <clears throat> an understanding that our language, and I'm going, I'm kind of skipping back and forth, going back to the travel thing, but language, which is often influenced by popular culture, we have terms like wheels up, which means travel, you're going somewhere, and wheels down, which means you've arrived at your destination, right? Because what was it, the, I think it was the show Criminal Minds, because they'd always, they'd always get these cases that were in another state, and once they figured out what they were going to do, it's like they'd, whoever was leading the thing would look at everybody else and say, wheels up in 20. Okay, we've got to get ready. Got to go grab my suitcase. <laughs> Whatever it is, wheels up in 20. So I say that because we're, I said you were pilots, but we are wheels up, brethren. We left the tarmac back in the day when we decided to take this journey, right, and to walk a little bit different path. We left a good while back. Jesus said to the one who wanted to, first there was one who wanted to wait and, and bury their father, come and follow me. Well, let me go and let me go and bury my father. Father may not even have been sick. Let me go wait him out. He's going to die one day, and as soon as that happens, I'll be ready. Or let me go say goodbye to the people at my house. Yeah, he, uh, he said to those, no one, after putting their hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the destination, right? Or fit for the kingdom of God, as he put it. And that's in Luke chapter 9. You can read that. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to, to pull down a little bit of a, a backdrop here just for my own benefit. <laughs> Maybe it helps the point I'm trying to make here, but it's a little, it's a little diversion. It's a backdrop. I'm in the fourth grade, not today. This is in 19, what, 77? <laughs> God. 1977, okay? I'm in the fourth grade. And there was an exercise <clears throat> where each student had to, I don't remember if it was a postcard, a letter, but the teacher picked out these um, destinations, and each student had to send whatever it was, a, a letter, postcard, to a chamber of commerce in some city in the United States. And mine happened to be Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And I don't know how much time after that, it was only a, a week or two, I get this, and I never got a 10-year-old getting mail back in 1977 was a big deal. I don't know if you could get a 10-year-old to look at Well, some of the kids get off the bus, check their mailbox before they, and usually if there's just mail in there, they, <laughs> they close the lid and go on in the house. But if it's a package, they usually run in the house with that. But me getting a big manila envelope when I was 10 years old, and it was this thick, I thought, and it said Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce. 
And in here was all kinds of flyers and all kinds of just data about Cape Cod and what the kind of thing that Chambers of Commerce did back in the day, and maybe they still do. So, yeah, I got this, and it's still, I, I, that, that folder still exists somewhere, that envelope. I've seen it in the last decade, I think, in a storage box or something somewhere. So it, it's still around. Not sure exactly why, but yeah. So Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce. Now to me, as a 10-year-old in Burke County, that was, that might as well have been Saturday because it seems so far away, so far away. Now, another world and, and never knowing, never knowing what's in your path, right? Never knowing what's in your journey. So I say that, and that was only, you know, yeah, what, however many years ago. So it's another world, and you, yeah. So fast forward to July of 2021. I uh, spent a couple nights, Katrina and I did, on the Cape. Only 44 years later, <laughs> a short 44 years later, I'm spending the night in Cape Cod. We ventured out to Martha's Vineyard, and I know I probably told you about all this as it, when it happened, but went out to Martha's Vineyard, toured the island, and as you know, there's obviously the presence there of celebrity and, and books that have to do with, or books where Martha's Vineyard are set in Martha's Vineyard and movies like Jaws and all these different you know, and, the, and again, the celebrities that live there, and you see some of those places. It was kind of a thrill to me to see uh, where Walter Cronkite used to live. That was the most memorable for me because when I was a kid, Walter Cronkite was 10 feet tall, and that's the way it is. Yeah, evening news from Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite. It's easy for me to say. But, uh, yeah, it's all that stuff there. But then the driver pointed out at one point during this tour just directionally, it wasn't the exact spot, but he said, and over here, just a few miles off the coast, is where the plane went down with JFK Jr. and his wife and her sister. So this Piper Saratoga um, carrying these three people, and yeah, piloted by JFK Jr., and it tragically went down, of course. That was July the 16th, 1999. Can you believe that? This July will be 24 years. I can't, that blows my mind. <sighs> yeah. So anyway, I'll leave that, I'll leave that backdrop down and, and circle back to it. Um, for he was looking for the city which has foundations. Now that's something, in my opinion, that we are losing. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Who was? Abraham. That's what Hebrews tells us, right? For he was looking for a city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now, Christ said, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. And we want wheels down right there, don't we? When Christ, when we read and we understand and we feel in our hearts that Jesus Christ says, I, have, I must go so the Comforter can come, and he talks about going and preparing a place for us, and we know that that's the destination, that place that he has prepared for us. That's where we want wheels down, right? I can't see it. I can imagine it. I can try to imagine it, but I can't, I can't see it. But that's okay because by definition, Hebrews also tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The conviction that Christ has gone to prepare a place for me, the conviction you have that he's gone to prepare a place for you. You know, just as sure as we get in the ninth, 10th, 11th grade and start thinking, well, graduation, and then next thing you know, here it is, you're a week away. And uh, there's several people in our family um, got invited to something next Sunday that I had to decline because I already had a previous engagement, which I'm, I'm happy about. But anyway, so it's how fast time goes, and you watch these things happen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, but the conviction of things not seen. Now, we talk about AI. We have talked about it here a little bit. Artificial intelligence and its potential, right? Good and bad. And anything that can be used for good can also be used for bad. We know that, and we know that it eventually will be, and probably already is. We don't even want to know those things necessarily. But I want to talk to you for a second about another AI that was before 
maybe before artificial intelligence. Who knows how long that's been, how, how long that's been out there. But there's another AI. Do you know what an attitude, attitude indicator is? Now, I know there's some smart aleck thoughts probably passing through out there. We know what those attitude indicators, they just, you know, bad attitude. How do you know? But that's not what I mean. Now, there are some of those thoughts passing through, but I'm going to <clears throat> tell you what an attitude indicator is. The attitude indicator, AI, formerly known as the gyro horizon or artificial horizon, is a flight instrument that informs the pilot of the aircraft orientation relative to Earth's horizon and gives an immediate indication of the smallest orientation change. The miniature aircraft and horizon bar mimic the relationship, and it's, it's on all aircraft. The small aircraft is the one that's on the little, on the little gauge there. <clears throat> the miniature aircraft and horizon bar mimic the relationship of the aircraft relative to the actual horizon. It is a primary instrument for flight, an instrument meteorological conditions. So this is for you to keep the plane in its right orientation, right? If you know how to if you know how to do that. An artificial or gyro horizon is the main instruments pilots use to fly through bad weather and low visibility conditions. It indicates the aircraft's orientation relative to the earth, expressed as pitch Roll and yaw. Y W. Now, <clears throat> on that Friday afternoon, evening of July the 16th, 1999, JFK Jr. went out to Essex Airport in New Jersey, where this Piper Saratoga. I guess, was kept. And you'd like to think that he went out there and done an inspection, went through the checklist, and made sure that this plane was flight ready. After all, he was going to be flying it, and he was going to have his wife and her sister on board. The, and I think, you, I'm, I'm not a pilot, but they tell me you have to file a, a flight plan, and then how can they keep up with all the stuff that's in the air? But the plan was, as I understand it, to fly off the Connecticut coast, eventually arriving at the little airport, which we, we saw that too, and, and it was not very far from that airport where he pointed out the part of the ocean where the plane went down. But <clears throat> eventually going to the little airstrip on Martha's Vineyard and to attend John's cousin Rory's wedding at Hyannis Port, which is just across what I assume is the Nantucket Sound that you have to take from Cape Cod over to Martha's Vineyard, and of course Nantucket's there too, but <clears throat> just across the Nantucket Sound to Hyannis Port, which is the, the, the Kennedy compound or whatever it was where this wedding was taking place. That was the plan. Then there was this something that couldn't be planned for. Right. Now, prior to July the 16th, 1999, it could have probably been planned for, and your certifications elevated to where you could, you know what I mean? So maybe prior to the trip, it could have, could have been planned for, but on this evening and on this trip, no, it couldn't have been planned for. JFK Jr. did not hold an instrument rating. He was only certified to fly under visual flight rules. And in a descent over water at night, he, uh, he experienced spatial disorientation, which I can't imagine. I cannot imagine. I can't imagine experiencing spatial disorientation standing flat foot on the ground in the dark. But you're however many thousands of feet up. You're the pilot of the plane. You don't have a co-pilot. 
and you experience spatial disorientation. In other words, you don't know if you're, you don't, you don't, you just don't know. And you've lost the visible landmarks are obscured. You can't, it's, you're in the dark. The weather's not cooperating. Can you imagine? And that's, this is not about the horror that must have been felt on that little plane. The result, of course, we all know. Um, not good. But it, it happens. I think it happens to us sometimes. It's called being overwhelmed. It's called, it's not that disastrous because we can, we can get through it. Jesus Christ ask a group of men and maybe there were some women there too I'm not don't, every time we say men doesn't mean there's no women I'm just saying I know we know that he told that group who woke him up and said oh my gosh we're, gonna, we're all going to die we're going to perish and what did he say what was the question why are you fearful what do you mean why am I fearful? I'm on this little boat rocking back and forth. And look at the, that's it. We're, we're going to die. We're just going to die. We can't swim from here. Water's too rough. It's too far. It's just going to drown. Why are you fearful? Oh, ye of little faith. And that's in Matthew 8, verse 26, I believe. I know, brethren, that <clears throat> some must fly, have flown, by visual rules. I'm not talking about airplanes. We, we see it. We know that it happens. The centurion. The centurion we read about that was at the cross. And it got ugly, didn't it? When Christ breathed his last, when he, when he called out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me and gave up the ghost, and the world got ugly for a little bit, didn't it? I mean, it, there was some junk happening. The centurion felt, felt it, and saw it. Now, I believe it's Matthew and Mark who says that this centurion said, surely this man was the son of God. You're there as a centurion. You've probably had a hand in all the things that have taken place. And in your heart you realize, surely... We have just crucified the Son of God. I can't imagine that terror either. Now, I think it's Luke that says that this centurion glorified God and said, surely this was a righteous man. So either way, to come to that understanding at that time is hard, hard to imagine. Yeah. Surely this was a righteous man, or surely this was the Son of God. And after the definition of faith in Hebrews chapter 1, or chapter 11, verse 1, after this definition of faith, Hebrews 11 talks about some pilots, doesn't it? And no, Pete Maverick's not included in that. But it does talk about Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Rahab, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up a couple of verses in that, and I'm going to, I'm almost done here. Let me, James, chapter 11, first of all, it says in verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them. 11 verse, Hebrews eleven thirteen. They did not receive the things promised. <clears throat> they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on the earth. And again, I'm reading from the NIV. I think the King James and others says pilgrims and other things. But people who say such things show now think about it. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. That doesn't mean if I'm in Singapore that I'm thinking about Burke County or the United States because it says here 
if all these people were still, well, let me back down. Who say since they show they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country that they had left, they would have opportunity to return. So that's not what they're talking about. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. If you are looking for that country, if you're homesick for a country, if you're looking for that better country, not the United States, not Japan, not Russia, not China, not any other place, but that destination where you want your wheels down. I don't know how much you've flown, but every time those wheels leave the ground, now, don't get me wrong, we all know, or I think we tell ourselves that flight is a safe form of travel, and it is. When you consider how many planes take off and land every day, yes, you hear about a crash every once in a while, but it is a safe way to travel. But for me, going down that runway and the plane starts to bounce and do its little shutter, and then it gets soft and it goes up, and you think, all right, didn't crash on takeoff. So even when you know that it's a safe form of travel, and statistically, it's okay. But we also know that there will be another crash somewhere, sometime. And for the people on board, the statistics don't matter, do they? <laughs> so then it's, it's the opposite effect as you're coming down and you, you feel that drop. It's not quite that drastic, hopefully, but you feel it. You, your stomach kind of gets light because it <laughs> doing that descent thing. And you hear that screech and the plane slowing down and the jets kick in. And you're like, all right. We made it once again, like like David used to say when we rode motorcycle. We cheated death again. Yeah, but we want wheels down in that place that Christ has gone to prepare for us. We just want it. We just want it. And this scripture tells us that God is not ashamed to call Himself our Father if that's what we're looking for. So that's why we're here, right? That's why we'll be here next week eating fish. Hopefully, God will. Because <laughs> we won't. Wheels down with a big belly. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, I digress. Um, instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And I'm going to skip down to verse 33. Who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice. When it's all these names that I've, I called out to you just a few minutes ago, a couple minutes ago. It, <clears throat> who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. Who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury, quenched the fury of flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. Whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. And you can go to Acts and read about that. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. Ask John the Baptist. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in the, desert, in the deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Have you ever read that last line and considered it carefully? Since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us, those people in this 11th chapter, this faith hall of fame in Hebrews, together with us would they be made perfect. Wee, that's good stuff. So, <clears throat> again, I said it came to mind this morning, the called, the chosen. What's the difference? I don't know. I don't know that answer. I've never come up with a great concrete answer for myself as to how to decipher that or exactly what it means, and maybe that's what it's all about for us to consider and think about and ponder. Called and chosen. 
One thought is that maybe the chosen are the ones who learn to use the instruments. Trust the things that are reading for you because that gyro or that uh, imitation horizon is reading things for you, isn't it? If you're piloting a plane and you can't see, you're in the dark over water, and you can, you can read that gauge, it's, it's reading stuff for you. It's got its fillers out there. It knows where the plane is relative to the ground. And you've got to trust it. We have those things on board, brethren. They're called the Holy Spirit of God and faith. And their fillers are out there. And it knows where you are in your journey. It knows whether you're sideways or upside down. And we have an opportunity now to make sure we are in tune. That when it gets to the, the times like we talk about when we can't see, the weather's bad, it looks ugly. Just trust those instruments. Where am I? How am I doing on my journey? That's the reason when I got up here I said, your pilots, check your gauges, look at your instruments. That's part of what Pentecost is about, is it not? That's what Passover is about. Getting in tune. Learning how to fly blind. Doesn't matter how bad it gets. I've got a horizon monitor. Should have. We can fly visually sometimes. The centurion did. Based on what he was seeing and feeling at the time. Now, it doesn't go on to say what happened to the centurion. Was he saved? Because he made that confession in his heart? Surely we've killed the Son of God. You think God didn't hear those words and understand what was in that person's heart? If we don't, we don't believe Scripture because Scripture says he doesn't care about the outward man. He didn't care what this centurion had done. He didn't care what the guy on the cross that said, I'm not worthy. Or I am worthy, in other words, of my punishment. This man has done nothing. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Okay. Okay. I'll tell you right now, you will be with me in paradise. Yeah. We have an opportunity, I believe, because they couldn't have planned Given his skill set, he couldn't have planned. He, maybe he went and checked out the plane, made sure because, hey, my wife and my sister-in-law is going to be on board. Let's, let's make this a safer flight. Maybe he'd done it who knows how many times, going from New Jersey to Martha's Vineyard, up and down. But something happened. He was the only person, and he lost his awareness. Now, this isn't a message against John F. Kennedy, regardless of what your politics or anything else is, it's, it's spatial disorientation. And brethren, let me tell you, when the fog gets thick, we don't want spatial disorientation. So trust your instruments, God's Holy Spirit, and your faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The absolute assurance. That runway is there. That place is for me. Christ said so. And I can't wait till it's wheels down. Whew. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why are you fearful? Why do you have spatial disorientation? Wheels up, brethren, because you were born to fly. And if you don't believe it, just reference Isaiah 40, 31. Of course. 